Good morning! It's crazy to be here. Like, it's been so wild that we haven't had events like this in so long. It's great to be here. Great to see everyone. Good morning. Yeah, hello. Welcome to Slash. We are so excited to be here. This is amazing. Uh, I want to start by apologizing uh, for not being Harry Stebbings. <laughs> You were all promised Harry Stebbings. You have me, Michael Stothard. I'm the editor of Sifted. Um, not the first time that I've stood in for Harry Stebbings. Uh, I've been asked on numerous occasions to be his, uh, his, his body double and his backup. Uh, I also once crashed a party pretending to be Harry Stebbings. Another fun fact. <laughs> um, so we're here with, to talk about product, with the man who has defined product in our era. Is that too much to say? Is that too nice? <laughs> Thank you very much. No, I mean... It's been the, a lot of hard work. <laughs> uh, the, the iPod, uh, the iPhone, Nest, uh, seminal products of our era. It's incredibly excited, exciting to talk about it with you. Thanks so much for being here. Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but first, I, I believe that you have some product experience with Finland. And indeed, was your first... Nearly your first ever time outside the U.S. was to do product in Finland. Go on, tell us. Oh, uh, it was crazy. So the first time I was in Finland was almost 30 years ago. Most of you are probably not even 30 in the audience. But 30 years ago, I was here. I was just about 23 uh, years old, 22, 23 at the time. And I was working for a company called General Magic. And uh, there's a great documentary you should check out uh, uh, on that. But we were making the... Uh, iPhone about 15 years earlier than the world needed it. Let's put it that way. And so when I came here, I was, you know, I didn't know anything. There was no internet at the time. There was hardly any cell phones. So I, I was coming to, to Helsinki and then Tampere, Finland, and I'm going to visit a company called Nokia. I was like, what? Nokia? Who? Where am I going? I didn't even have a cell phone then. There was very few cell phones in the world back in 92. 293, something like that. So I go to Nokia, but it was a September time frame, and literally they bring out GSM. GSM had just started, like it had, they're just working on GSM. And then they're gonna go, we have a super secret demo for you. And I'm like, what is this? And they go, there's this thing called SMS, texting. And literally I got to see SMS and texting here in Finland, before the world saw it, I had no idea what it was. I had no idea if it was going to be a success or anything. But it's so wild, like 30 years ago to where we are today, and then having this inside Finland right now was just, it's an incredible, and then, you know, then there was the iPhone and all the other stuff that came after it. It's crazy to think that, you know, my, my real understanding of mobile networks and and devices was right here. Do you remember what you said or that you thought? Did you think this is ridiculous? This will never catch on. You know, I'm 23. I had no idea. I was like, ah, I, you know, I, I knew what kind of the mobile network was because, you know, a couple people around General Magic had Motorola StarTax back in the day, those little things. But back, back then, you just didn't know. Like, it was pre-internet. You didn't know anything. So it's like, this could be cool. I don't know. But uh, pretty wild that uh, it, it all kind of started right here, you know. <laughs> Amazing. Woo! Yeah, Finland! Woo! <laughs> um, so since then, as I set up in my little intro, you've created three of the products that have defined our age. The watchword of Slush is um, to be like radically practical. We're trying to give advice. There's a lot of people in this audience who are designing products. Tell us, what is your secret sauce? <laughs> Tell them how to do what you did. Give us the magic. Well, magic, the magic is really, you know, understanding need. Understanding what people really need or what they will need with technology. And so for me, you know, learning from the disaster that was General Magic, you can see it up there on the slide, that was the first one up to the, up on the, the left there, um, was making sure that you are solving a problem that people are starting to have, okay? Not everyone has, but are starting to have, and technology can start to fill it. With General Magic, what we were doing was we were creating the iPhone 15 years too soon. That was, we were doing email. Most people didn't even have email back then. 
most people, we were doing downloadable games and buying tickets online, but on a private network, not on an internet network. So we were doing, we were even doing emojis. We had emojis. We had these, you know, these animated little graphics and things. We had all this stuff in 1993, 94. The world didn't even have networks. We didn't have mobile. We didn't have email. We didn't have internet. We didn't have any of these things. So we were solving for problems that were just, you know, a decade and a half too soon. And so, so yes, you can solve a problem, but you have to make sure that people are going to understand it. And when we showed that product and we showed it off to the world, because the world, you know, most people probably don't know this, but we were, we were destined to beat Microsoft. People were saying we were going to crush Microsoft right? This is in 93, 94. They are going to take over the world. This was a team of people um, who created the Macintosh, okay? And we spun out of Apple and we were building this thing. And literally when we showed it to the world, everyone was like, wow. And unless you were an uber geek, because they're you'd, uber, uber geek, people were like, oh, that's interesting, I think. I, I'm not quite so sure. And then when we launched it and we put it in the stores, we sold after spending a hundred million dollars back in the day, a hundred million or more back in the day, 4,000 units in total. So you have to remember, you may be solving a problem. You just have to make sure society understands, or at least a few people, a larger enough people, set of people understand that there is a problem to be solved. And so Ultimately, fast forward to the iPhone days or 2005, 2007, um, people already had email, people had internet, people had mobile communications. They knew what, you know, m mobile music was because of the iPod and those things. And so that's why it took off like crazy, right? But 15 years too soon, it wasn't there. So you really have to understand, are you delivering a painkiller to people and do people understand what it is you're doing? Stop trying to create something that impresses the engineer or the other person next to you who's really geeked out. Try to make sure you're building something that gives superpowers to every person. Make it really easy and they can understand it. And you can, and, and, and they, um, you don't have to be so, you know, whizzy and techy about it all. So that's really the difference. So you need to have timing. Timing is there. Nail, timing. nail the timing. What about the way a product kind of feels? What about the like soul and the spirit of these things? Because you know when you look at the you know the early the early iPod, um, it wasn't it, it wasn't. I mean it was cool like a thousand songs in your pocket like the tech was fun and stuff. But like there were other things like that. It just felt like you wanted it. Right. I wanted it in my in my in my body. Well, well that's a great question, Michael. So. Well, the way I see it and the way I think about products approaching it is 50% of what you put into that product has to have an irrational reason for existing. There's got to be a reason, rational, like logic, like, yes, it's existing, it's solving this problem. But the other 50% has to be emotional. It has to hook you. It has to grab you and say, okay, I need this now. If it's all rational, people go, hmm, that's neat. Okay, yeah, I need it, but do I really need to get off my chair and commit and go do it? If you do something that's 100% emotional or mostly emotional, people are like, that's neat, but you know what? It's novelty. After a week or two, it's going to end up in the drawer. It's going to do whatever. It's not like doesn't hook you. If you hook the two things together, need plus emotion, that gets people to go, wow, I really want it and I really need it. Right? And that's the big thing is splitting and making sure you understand you're working with both parts of your brain because some people approach most pro a lot of problems rationally. A lot of people approach them logically and some people are exactly opposite of that. And so what you have to do is blend those things together, not just in the product, not just in the user interface, but the entire customer journey from the time they discover it to the time they use it to the time they even, you know, return it or do something with it. You want to make sure you have that balance all the way through, not just in the product experience, but in the overall cu all customer touch points. Was Nest emotional? Oh, Nest was very emotional. And do you want to tell people what Nest for those? I mean, yeah, I think yeah. most people know, but do you yeah, want to tell them well, Nest just a quick recap. So, what Nest was all about was it was really a company to save energy. 
So this was just after the clean tech debacle of 2008-2009 when everyone was rushing to do green good things for the planet. We decided we were going to go off and save energy. And the reason being is that if you look at mo most homes, 50% of their energy costs were all due to heating and cooling. And heating and cooling, for most people, like, yeah, whatever. They didn't even know that part of their bill. They get a bill and it just says pay. They didn't know that heating and cooling took all that stuff. And it was being controlled by a product that might have been 20 euros, 50 euros, wherever. It was ugly. It was this beige, yellowing box on the wall. People would hide it away. So they were spending all this money every month, every year, using a product with a horrible interface and they didn't even know what was going on. So we said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna blend the rational part of saving money and saving energy with the emotional part of making something sexy that was on the wall that you're like, you point to. You think about all the furnishings your home, your furniture, your artwork, whatever in, in your home. You wanna make a certain kind of experience, right? Well, this was all about making sure that this was a prized possession on your wall that you wanted to interact with, with to talk about while it was saving money as well. So that was really that, that blend of the two. But people, when, we first, when I first started talking, to, uh, talking about it, people were like, thermostat, are you nuts? Who the hell cares? The market was tiny. The market was maybe $200 million market because it had been, you know, it was just a utility thing. We changed the whole script on that. And it was all about, first and foremost, to save energy, to save making more power plants, and then ultimately it got to where it was. So that was another really uh, interesting blend of, of those things that came together, and people thought we were crazy, absolutely crazy. But then it turned out to be crazy smart, I think. So, um, so now you're doing something slightly different. You have Future Shape. Yeah. Um, can you tell us briefly what Future Shape is? the fund, what are you doing? But also, how do you like spot product geniuses now? You know, like you, you, you can do it, you, sure. you've got a track record of doing it yourself, but it's a slightly different skill spotting someone else. Like, right. what, are you, what are you looking for? Like, what's, what's, what's on your mind when you're talking, talking to people? Okay, so first about Future Shape. So Future Shape is um, it's, uh, a fund, or my own fund. Um, and we have a teams. We have teams, uh, uh, people both in uh, San Francisco as well as in Paris. And what we're doing is we're funding deep technology companies around the world. So we have over 200 250 direct investments in companies all around the world doing hard things, hard things that most VCs would not invest in until, you know, until uh, it becomes popular. So for one instance, maybe you guys have all heard of uh, Impossible Foods. So plant-based meats, those kinds of things. Impossible Foods back in 2014, I think was when we first invested, no one cared. No one really cared, but we said, this is important. This is important for the planet. This is important for people's health. And so what we decided was we were gonna invest in that. We were one of the first checks in Impossible Foods. Now, plant-based foods are everywhere. You know, you run into it, there's probably 200, 300 company startups all going after this kind of stuff. So we try to do stuff that's really early, before it's popular, before there's a rush of money into it, because we think it's the right thing to do not just because it's fashionable, right? Same thing with Nest, um, those kinds of things. We try to find the trends, find those entrepreneurs going to, who are on top of the next trend. And so to your question specifically, and I'm sure there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there in this room who do this, are cutting edge. And those cutting edge people, when I meet them, they're people that I can learn from. And if I have a first discussion with them, they are teaching me something, and I'm reading all the time. I'm digesting so much stuff. They're teaching me something that I can't even get access to, even in the popular mainstream press or whatever it is. When, when they're teaching me something, when I'm talking to them, and then I'm also able to give them some advice or, or some ideas, and they're learning as well, when that two-way street opens up and we're communicating on that level, and we're both learning, I say, that. That's the entrepreneur, that's the team I wanna, I wanna get interested in because they're open to learning 
and I'm going to be learning from them and we're on the cutting edge. We can work together to bring the cutting edge to the world much more quickly um, because we can build our, our, put our networks together, put our brains together and make it happen. So it's really first about that spark, about am I learning and are they understanding the need and are they understanding the rational and the emotional need for what they're trying to do? Those things are really, really key for me for how we find these, these people. And we've, like I said, over 200 companies and they're all around the world. We're not just Silicon Valley. Actually, I think we're doing more deals outside the US now and especially outside of Silicon Valley than, than we have ever done. And that's only increased um, over the years. In fact, I moved away. I moved away from Silicon Valley. Um, I want to ask you about your move, your move to sure. Paris and uh, you can hype up European tech because we're all here and we're all fans. <laughs> um, but, yeah, is... Um, sorry, I just totally lost my place. Um, is... Oh, yeah, so, so to pitch you, if people want to pitch you, basically what you're saying is sure. tell you something you don't know, right? Tell you something that you can't get access to. Like, that's the way to get Future Shape interested, right? It's, uh, yeah. That's, that's uh, uh, the lesson uh, uh, Well, here. that's, yeah, the big thing is, if it's popular, if you're coming to me with, like, I have something for the metaverse, I'm like, no, thank you. If you have something that tells me I'm doing, you know, sales tech or ad tech or media tech, or I'm doing, you know, th those kinds of things that are not going to be about helping the environment, helping societies, helping the health of individuals. We don't talk about it. it that just it doesn't matter. We want the stuff that's fundamentally going to change the planet for the better. I don't want to talk about social. I don't want to talk about any of that stuff. That stuff, yeah, that's whatever. I want to talk about stuff that matters, that's going to, that's going to impact our, our families and, our, and our, our kids, our grandkids. That's stuff that we need to do. That's what's most important for what our team does. And so you can see some things here on the slides. Thank you very much. You can see some stuff here on the slides. It's crazy stuff. Like if you look here, like Menlo Micro is up there uh, uh, in the upper right. They are actually replacing all relays. Now, if you remember back in the day, there's, there were vacuum tubes and we transferred to transistors. Like that was a huge jump. Well, at that same time, and before that, there's things called relays, solid state relays, electromechanical relays, what have you. Those things have not changed for 150 years. Menlo Micro up there has made a solid state switch. The first innovation in relays and solid state relays in 150 years. It is so fundamental to everything we do on this planet. It may not sound incredible, but in the electrification and the wireless of everything that we're moving to, it is absolutely critical. Over 20, 30 billion of these things are sold every year. And now with this one product, it's like moving from vacuum tubes to transistors. So that's the kind of stuff, like really fundamental stuff. And we save tons of energy, tons of um, uh, uh, wasted heat, all that stuff with that. We talked about impossible. Turn tide, turn tide, next generation electric motors highly efficient electric motors so we don't just burn up heat and you know when they're when they're running for electric vehicles for all fans for equipment in factories again does it sound sexy maybe not but you know how much energy is wasted when we produce 100% of the energy today 60 to 70% of that energy is wasted wasted as heat we just lose it we're trying to save energy, we're trying to save the planets, try to save CO2, all those kinds of things, emit less. We're wasting so much. We're going for those fundamental things that matter. Not freaking metaverse. Sorry, everybody in the audience dude, in metaverse, but we got to save the planet, all right? <gasps> Woo, yeah. Um, so you moved to Paris six years ago. You're one of us now. Yep. You are part of the European tech ecosystem, which, as you can see, has never been stronger or more booming. Um, why did you come here? Because we're so great, but why, why else did you come here? And what are you excited about in Europe? And I guess maybe those questions have an overlap in terms of their Venn diagram of like climate stuff, but... but 
Give us this. Yeah, so really, I started coming here in 2009, besides work, but I started coming here for leisure and stuff in 2009, and um, actually wrote the business plan for Nest while I was in Europe, and went back to go build it. And so I had started to see the inklings of a kind of a startup culture in 2009, but it was really, really nascent. But we fell in love, uh, my wife and I and our, our family fell in love with Europe from our visit in 2009, where we stayed eight months or so in Paris and, and, and different places around Europe. And so we just kept coming back. And then we bought an uh, apartment in Paris. We kept back, coming back every year, made lots of friends and stuff. And I started seeing, literally seven, six, seven years ago, things starting booming, blossoming at the very lowest levels inside of all these countries, Paris being, or in France being one of them, but all around Europe. And I was like, this is the place to be. Silicon Valley, after being there 26 years, I'm like, yeah, I've known a lot of it, know a lot about it. But I'm like, there are problems to be solved all around this world. And there are smart people all around this world. And we need to go find those entrepreneurs because we have to light a fire across the entire planet to get us to where we need to go as a, as a, as a species, right? And so coming to Europe and watching it watching this whole scene grow. I think Slush might be exactly that many years old, six, seven years old. Watching this just blossom and just take over. You know, people are like, no, there's never going to be any unicorns in Europe. And no, there's never. We need a Google. Why don't we have Google of Europe? And why don't we have the Apple of Europe and all this stuff? Well, it's coming now, right? It is absolutely coming. It's there. You're the reality. You can see it here. And it is stronger than ever. And like I said, we're doing more deals here than than the most places in the world because it's so strong, the talent, the education, the openness, um, we just love it here. And we're continuing to invest and, and, and building a life and, and we're staying here in Europe. We're not moving back to the US. So thank you. you guys are very interested and it's great to be part of this community. Um, and you're interested in the same themes. You're interested in the clean tech, like oh, yeah, innovation all the that same saves thing. the world. All, all the same things. All the same things. So speaking of products. Products, yes. I believe that you've been working on a secret product. I have. Hiding from the world. I have. Um, that you are going to announce to us today. Uh, so maybe over, over, over to you, but I for one am on tenterhooks. Okay. Well, everyone, you know, I love building great products. Um, it, build, working with great teams of people, helping people today to build great things. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm the old guy in the industry now. I used to be the young one, like I said, when I came to uh, Finland so long ago. Well, over the years with, uh, with Future Shape, you know, and working with all these entrepreneurs and helping them, I realized something. I realized that the only reason why I'm on this stage today is because someone helped me to get here over the years. Someone mentored me, helped me get to this point and, and believed in me. And so, I went back over all the, all the years and all the things, lessons I've learned and all the mentors I worked with. And I, and I looked back and I said, a lot of my mentors have died. A lot of my mentors have died. And I was like, you know what? That baton of mentorship has been passed from them to me. Or at least I'm grabbing it. The only way I can give back to, to honor the mentors who gave to me is to give back to the community, to give back to the world. And so today I want to announce a whole crazy new product that I've been working on for the last 18, 24 months during COVID. I didn't know COVID was coming, but it came. And it's called Build. And it's a book. Today is the, 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 the teaser day, the launch day for Build, a, a, an unorthodox guide to making things worth making. It's not a, bi bi a bibliography at all. It's not autobiographical. It's a 
book of mentorship. It's an encyclopedia of mentorship. It's all the questions I get asked all the time, the things that I've seen, the things that I've learned. It's got all kinds of micro chapters all about, you know, how to approach a career, how to approach a startup, how to about, think about product design, how to think about doing things, how do you choose lawyers, how do you choose uh, uh, venture capitalists, how do you build a board, all of these things. So we've been putting this book together, distilling it down, and working through it many, many times, but literally, Build is it. We're gonna, it'll be launching and it'll be available in May. Uh, uh, the, uh, next year. It's going to be in 14 different languages and regions around the world. Obviously, it's print. It's a printed book. I thought it was going to be easy. It's as hard, if not harder, than actually making products. And so this is it. This is what we're working on. And hopefully, you know, it's going to help a lot of people out there. Um, and, and, uh, and maybe you're going to find that, uh, you know, it might give you some confidence. What I've always found with working with all these entrepreneurs is that typically they have the right answers. They already have the right answers. They're right here in their gut. But what they don't have is the experience and confidence to trust their gut. So my hope is this book will allow you to start to trust your gut more and take those big leaps and to get that mentorship the way I had the mentorship and spread it far and wide so that you can go on and, and accelerate your missions inside your companies and change the world dramatically and as quickly as we were able to do. So that's really about it. It's really about giving back and, and, and helping a lot of people out there trying to change the world. So that's what it's all about. So there you go, build, build everybody. I hope you like it. Uh, that's really exciting. I can't wait to read it. Um, well, our time is up sadly, um, but we've learned a huge amount about timings of building products, getting a like soul into a product. I thought the idea of it being like, if it's just useful, it's neat. Uh, it has to be like 50 soul, 50, uh, you know, like actually solving like rational problems. It's fascinating to pitch you. You need to tell you something you really don't know. And it can't be about the metaverse. Definitely not. No <laughs> NFT sneaker startups for Tony. Uh, it has to be solving like real fundamental problems, ideally to stop the world from burning and us all from dying a terrible climate related death. Um, really fantastic insights. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Round of applause for Tony. Thank you all Round of you. Have a great slush. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you out there.